Guy here, back again with another live video for you. Uh, this is the fourth in our series of videos. Uh, last time we talked a bit about automotive myths, but this time we're taking the show back to its original, its origins, and that is uh, answering your automotive questions. There seems to be a lot of those that pop up, so why don't we uh, get to answering those questions so that we maximize the time that we have. <laughs> you know, when this happens, and I'm, I'm shooting in my shop, I can edit this stuff out and just start over. But with the live performance, obviously, you get my little tongue slips and everything else. Enjoy! Uh, so now we will get to some of my bad name reading and uh, some of your automotive questions. Whoa! Uh, one of the first things I see is a very nice photograph of a very nice looking girl sitting on the back of a convertible, which kind of fits in today's topic of uh, hard top or convertible. It looks like uh, Valera Petrov likes uh, convertibles. So uh, if you head on over to the uh, Google Plus event page where uh, I will be taking these questions from, you can see that lovely photograph and can share with the world. Uh, I'm just going to get right down to it. Uh, we have Naveen Kumar. Uh, hey, Eric, is there any way you could demonstrate how Regan braking works? I mean, more practically, this would be gr of great help. You know, honestly, I'm going to have to pass on this one because I'm not even sure what Regan braking is. Uh, maybe it's a term. It's a term that I'm not familiar with. Maybe it is something I'm familiar with, but I just don't know. So I, I apologize. I just I'm not familiar with that. But I'm sure that in the comments of the video, many people will let me know. Hey, thanks. <laughs> okay, we have uh, Brian uh, Pilling, uh, and he just recently built the engine on his 1993 Pathfinder and cleaned everything including the inside or the outside of the throttle position sensor because of this I am not sure where its original position was the book says to check the sensor with ohms on a multimeter but I got no readings at all from the sensor I think I'm doing something wrong with the test but not sure is there another way to test these uh, or get them in the correct position Yes, throttle position sensors are very important. They provide input, obviously, to the computer of the throttle's position. Um, it's, it, it helps the computer figure out when it needs to go to idle because the throttle's closed, that kind of thing. And it, it works very similar to the volume knob on your stereo. So the more you turn the volume up, the louder everything gets. And it's, it's referred to as a potentiometer. So if you think of it that way, and you think of its position, I guess to help you, one of the first things I can tell you to try to get it close is if there's some witness marks on the outside of it that where the fasteners were when you originally removed it, perhaps you could place it in that same location or close to it and try that. Um, I don't believe you want to use an ohmmeter in this case. What an ohmmeter does is it actually sends current through the circuit uh, and you, you check its resistance. It, it gauges the resistance. Of, of an electrical component by sending a small electrical current through it uh, and that is equated to resistance. Now normally with throttle position sensors at least that I, as far as the testing and things that I know of we normally use like a voltmeter to do it and we do it with the key on and the engine off and that way you get a chance to see exactly what the computer is seeing because the computer interprets the throttle position as a voltage signal and that usually ranges from something very close to zero when the throttle is closed, not usually at like absolutely zero. It's usually somewhere like around point, it's usually around half a volt or so is what you'll see. And then as you raise or as you open the throttle, you get closer and closer to the reference voltage, which normally is about five volts. So when the throttle is closed, you want to see a reading somewhere, not more than a half a volt, but somewhere around that neighborhood. And then as you open it up, when it's completely open, what you're looking for is a voltage close to 5 volts. And once again, you may not get exactly that 5 volts, but it'll be 4 point whatever. But the, the higher it is, the, the more it equates to the throttle opening. So I wouldn't use an ohms test for that so much. And the other thing I'm wondering is if you have the leads on your DVOM placed correctly. Because if most DVOMs have different ports for where you would plug your leads into. And there's usually a common ground. And then there's different places where you can put the red lead or positive lead. And in one of those ports, you will be able to check voltage, you'll be able to check resistance and everything else. 
And the other one, that's actually for amp testing. And they usually have like maybe two in that case, like a low amp and a high amp, uh, depending upon your meter. But you want to be in the one for volts and ohms and all that stuff. So you may not have your leads hooked up correctly on your meter when you're doing this. I suppose you could hook it up, you know, according to the book. If the book's telling you to check resistance, check resistance. But just make sure your meter's hooked up correctly when you do this. And also make sure when you're checking resistance not to have it plugged in. It's not supposed to be plugged in when you're checking resistance. You want to separate it from the rest of everything. So if they want you to set it up using its resistance, make sure it's unplugged and check it that way. And hopefully they're going to tell you which pins to use because there's usually three inputs to a throttle position sensor, sometimes four. Uh, so you need to know which terminals you need to be on in order to get a proper reading. So I hope that helps you. I've had lots of questions coming in since then. Um, just starting from the oldest. Uh, these are dating back to uh, October 2nd. Uh, our next one is from Jaden Sweeney. And hi, Eric. I've got a Mitsubishi Lancer with an automatic transmission. It is a 1997 model. The gear changes have become sloppy as in the motor will slightly flare like 100 or so RPMs and almost seems like it's slipping into gear, like it slowly engages into the next gear. Uh, as it is, as it's age, should I replace the transmission fluid more often or go by the book? Also, what is your opinion of that treatment stuff you put in the gearbox? Thanks, Eric, by the way. Love your show, man. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, it does sound like your transmission mission is slipping, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. One of the first things I would do in that instance is I would check the fluid level. An automatic transmission is very dependent upon the fluid within it. It needs to be good fluid. Uh, it also needs to be free of any air. Uh, sometimes you'll pull a dipstick out of an automatic transmission. And by the way, make sure you're checking it. Normally, I believe on that transmission you check it while the engine is running in park on a level surface. This is really important. Not many people quite get the level surface part because if the vehicle's on a hill or something like that, you won't get a correct reading. So you really want to try to make sure that you're on a level surface. If you pull the dipstick out and you notice a bunch of bubbles on it, this could indicate that air is getting into the transmission fluid. If air is getting into the transmission fluid, <clears throat> it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause things to slip. Everything inside the automatic transmission is dependent upon the hydraulic pressures within it. Liquids are not compressible. I don't know if you know about that trick where you grab an egg and you try to squeeze it and try to crush it in your hand. It's a very difficult thing to do. Some people could do it, and yes, it makes a mess, but for the most part, it is an extremely difficult thing to do, if not impossible. And the reason that is is because liquids are not compressible. You can't squeeze them. You can squeeze the heck out of air, however. So if you're trying to maintain pressure within a system, if you introduce air into it, they act like little shock absorbers and little springs. So that means the fluid's not able to do its job as it moves around through the transmission. Uh, so if there's air in the system, then there could be a fault someplace that's introducing that air. Not real sure. Actually, an overfilled transmission can also introduce air into the system because the fluid level gets high enough to where it comes in contact with the spinning assemblies and gears and things like that, and it churns it up, kind of like a meringue on the inside of it. Uh, the other possibility is that your transmission is old and worn out. It's full of little clutch packs. Uh, you can I've got some videos out there on automatic transmissions and I disassemble them and you'll see like it's almost like a sandwich a lot of people bring up the motorcycle analogy it's very similar to a motorcycle clutch where you've got a steel disc a friction disc a steel disc a friction disc and it's it's all stacked up like a sandwich and what happens over time is <clears throat> the friction discs will wear it wear out and the friction material will wear out the same way your brake pads wear out on your brakes and once that friction material wears out the clearance inside that clutch pack is gone. So you try to put pressure behind it and it's just not able to, to have the clamping force that it used to because there's just not enough there. There's not enough to hold that thing together so it slips into gear. The other possibility is that you have seals that are worn out inside the transmission. If you've got this high pressure moving around inside you also need to be able to seal it and control it where it goes. So if one of those seals starts to go bad then that pressure tries to go and fill up that clutch pack to engage something, or it could be a band also. I should, I should probably mention that. But <clears throat> it's not able to fully do that because some of that pressure is bleeding off. So if the pressure is bleeding off, or if there's air in the system, or you've got a bad seal, or things are worn out, that could cause the symptom that you're having. The easiest thing to do, like I said, is check the fluid, make sure it doesn't have bubbles in it. Um, but, you know, kind of when you get to that point, it's... 
I wouldn't say that you have like an electro electronic problem or something like this causing this. I'm going out on a limb with this uh, because sometimes those little electric solenoids that send those pressures to the different parts of the transmission can fail and cause issues. But I believe on, well, on 97, it's kind of hard to say. But anyway, it sounds to me like your transmission may be on its way out. Now, what to do in that situation? You could try changing the fluid, but it's been, if it's been some time since you changed the fluid, you run the risk of it just failing completely. Uh, and I've talked about this before. As your transmission fluid wears or whatever inside the system, that's, I told you about those clutch, clutch packs that we're wearing out. Well, that material gets into the fluid. It gets embedded in the fluid. So the fluid, in essence, kind of becomes thicker. And in a way, that, that extra grit that's in the, in the fluid sort of helps it seal up. Now, you take that old fluid out, and you put new fluid in that doesn't have all this gritty stuff in it, and it isn't all thick. It'll just sneak right past those seals. It'll just fly right through the transmission. It'll do its job. Thing is, the transmission was worn out and was working OK with old worn out fluid, but you go to change it and all of a sudden you got this new fluid in there, it doesn't have that same stuff in it, it doesn't, it's not sealing up, it's just slipping past everything and everything slips and it's game over. So <clears throat> you, I would almost advise you to maybe take it to a transmission shop and have it professionally diagnosed. What they have at, at transmission shops is they have special gauges they can hook up to check those pressures that I spoke of and they can compare it to their specs and find out if it's low and if it is low, they can say, this particular circuit's the problem, they'll know exactly what's wrong with it. Or maybe you'll get a really experienced person, actually, this is more likely what will happen. You'll get a somewhat experienced person that says, yeah, that transmission is junk, and they'll sell you a new transmission. But my hope is, is they actually go through the process of diagnosis and say, yeah, it's not a solenoid, it's not some other cause, you, your transmission is slipping because it's worn out and needs to be replaced. As far as additives that you dump in, I tried this myself uh, with my Odyssey transmission a few years back, and I used uh, Lucas, Lucas transmission stuff. Some people swear by it, some people hate it. It's like that with just about every automotive product, it seems. I tried it, it didn't really work. In fact, it didn't do anything. And I didn't have a whole lot of faith that it would because all those things I just explained to you about the operation of the automatic transmission, that should tell you why. Uh, <clears throat> what this stuff, like those additives, do if you look at what that Lucas stuff is, it's, it's very thick. And it sort of does what that old fluid did. It's thicker and it might seal where something didn't seal and it also might condition, condition a seal that got hard and brittle and it needs to be pliable again. And that's, that's the chemistry behind how those things are supposed to work. But they're limited by the damage within your transmission. So I'm not saying those products don't work. What I'm saying is if your transmission is worn out and it has worn out internal parts, it's not likely that, that that's going to fix it for you. There's no such thing as a mechanic as a, in a can, as we say. So you, you can't shortcut it. You, you really, you got to address the problem. you got to bite the bullet on it. And it sounds to me with a slipping transmission that you have, if your fluid's at the proper level and it doesn't have any air in it, well, you may be looking at a transmission. We spent a lot of time on that one. Uh, that's okay. It's okay. We're helping everyone here today. Everyone. Oh, we have, uh, okay, J. Carific, Serific. Not real sure that, how we pronounce the C here, but hi. Do you ever use screw extractors, a.k.a. easy outs, when dealing with a bolt uh, with the head snapped off? What would you say is your most effective way of dealing with that? Excellent question. And I get asked this question a lot. In fact, I've thought about doing a video on this very thing. I never seem to get around to it. But, okay, I approach this in several different ways, and it's really dependent upon many different factors. And it's, I do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't necessarily have a go-to method every time that happens. It depends on how it happened. Is it cross-threaded when it went in? Is it just something that might have gotten over-torqued? Or was it rusted? Was it, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors there. You know, like if it's rusted, I might start with a little bit of penetrating oil to start with. But I tend to shy away from screw screw <laughs> screw extractors. Yes, let Eric speak now. I shy away from them uh, mainly because, well, I had a bad experience once, and I think you'll find a lot of mechanics, DIYers, techs, anybody who does any kind of mechanical work has had a bad experiences that lead them to certain certain things that they they say strong to. 
And I stay away from screw extractors, screw extractors because years ago when I was when I was in mechanic school, I was uh, putting on or taking off exhaust manifolds. It was an old Dodge 318 engine that I was disassembling, and I was taking off the exhaust studs, or I was taking off the exhaust bolts. And I think I nicked one of the studs, and I broke a stud off inside the cylinder head. That sucked. It was good that it was outside the car, though. Very happy about that. But Oof, just that that was a bad day. So what I tried to do was exactly what you suggest. I tried to use an easy out. So I drilled a hole large enough to install an easy out extractor and I attempted to use it. Well, as I was using it, it broke off inside the bolt that was broken off inside the cylinder head. Screw extractors are made from very, very, very hard steel. And as a result, there's only one drill bit that will take it down, and those are the diamond head, diamond tip drill bits. I had to send the cylinder head to a machine shop to have that easy out drilled out and the stud removed. And I'm sure it was quite a task, but they were up to it as a machine shop. They have all that stuff. They're used to working with metal. So I kind of shy away from the easy out method because of that, because I'm always afraid that I'm going to break an easy out off inside of something. And I use them for other things, not just bro not broken bolts. Um, I actually use easy outs to remove like the inner part of an antenna, the old style antennas, power antennas that used to go up and down in some cars. I use that to get the top part of the antenna out. So I do use them. I do have a use for them. I just shy away from them when removing fasteners that have broken off. Kind of one of my go-to methods, what I try to do is I try to remove it no matter what. I, you know, I, I try to stay away from drilling, tapping, and all that stuff. That is my last resort. I can say that. That's my last resort. If there's a little bit of the fastener still sticking up, that's great. That's really great. Because then I try to grab it with a little pair of vice grips or something like that and spin it out that way. Sometimes heat helps. Uh, if, if you're it, With aluminum, it gets a bit tricky. But if it's into cast iron, heat, heat really helps. You can heat up the fastener and hopefully you'll be able to get it out if you've got a little piece that's still there. Now, if it's broken off flush, I put a video out uh, a while back on removing rusty fasteners. I use the methods in that video to extract broken bolts, too. So I don't just use it to remove rusty fasteners. I remove, use it to remove broken bolts. And just to give you a summary about it, what I do is I take my air, air chisel, and I have a, a special uh, bit on the end of it that I've actually ground down to a very sharp point. And I take that, and I try to catch one edge of what's left of the fastener. And I start out by just making my divot. So I'll, I'll start out, and I'll hit it so that it's down. And then I'll move over to the sides so I can get it lined up, usually going counterclockwise, because that's the way most things loosen. And then I'll try to hit it with that air hammer in that direction to try to knock it loose. That impacting motion is very effective for things that are stuck or frozen. At least that's what I've found in my experience. So. Broken fasteners, that's, that's a lot of times what I do. I try to use some variant of that method. Now, I love the air chisel. I love the, the air chisel part of it because that allows me to sort of maintain focus and you know, you know, really control what's happening. However, you may not have access to an air compressor or an air chisel or something like that. You can do the exact same thing with a hammer and a punch. And I just take a punch and sharpen a punch to a very sharp point on a grinder and then I try to try to tap the fastener out is what I try to do. Um, anytime you can leave the threads intact, you're, you're golden. The last resort, as I said, is drilling and retapping the hole. The key to that is making sure you start your, your the first time you drill in, you start with the smallest drill bit. You don't start with the biggest, the same size thing. You always start with the smallest drill bit. But you just sort of, <clears throat> I use, uh, they have, I'm trying to think of what it's called. It's it's a tool. It looks like a pencil, and it's got a sharp tip on it. And you you use it to you you push down on it. It's spring loaded, and it makes a dent. I'm trying to think of what it's called. It's like a punch or something like that. But it's it and somebody's out there screaming at you, Eric. It's this. <laughs> okay, fine, thank you. But anyway, I I make that divot right in the center of the fastener. And that's, that's the important thing. You want to try to start your hole right in the center of, of that broken fastener. And you also want to make sure that you drill straight into it. You don't want to be at an angle or anything when you do it. Uh, then, you, like I said, you start with the smallest drill bit, 
and be patient. Okay, this this takes time. The more you try to rush it, you might just break off one of those drill bits, and you kind of be in that same spot I was in with that easy out. So be careful. Be just be slow, deliberate, patient, and that will get you through it. But I'll, I'll drill that first hole, the smallest one. I'll grab the next size drill bit up. I'll drill it up, I'll, and I'll just keep adding larger and larger drill bits until I get to the point where I've just about hit the the inside of the threads. What you'll start to see is you'll start to see sort of like the inside of the fastener. You begin to see the threads that are still there. Once I get to that point, I try to pull what's left out. So you might be able to because there's no tension on it now. You know, there is the fastener is missing, so to speak. And then I'll try to get that out. Uh, if that doesn't work, I get it as close as possible, and then I run a tap down through the hole, which hopefully cleans out the rest of the broken fastener. Put a new fastener in. Try it a couple times. Make sure it works. Make sure it's not too loose. But yeah, that's definitely worthy of a video, I would say. But that's that's how I go about handling that situation. You got to be careful. For screw extractors, I think you can understand why I'm a little bit nervous about using those. Let's move on, shall we? All right. Who's next? Um, let's just randomly pick somebody else here. We have um, Winston Buzon. Hi, Eric. I'm swapping a new motor into my 1991 Honda Accord. The new motor has newer OBD2 versus the OBD1 computer that originally came with. I figured that since uh, that if I had wait, I figured that since that if I was going to replace the motor, I should just replace it with a better one that puts out more horsepower and torque. Have you ever done a complex engine replacement or swap as this? Uh, and what are your thoughts on it? My thoughts on it are if you don't want to have problems like the problems you're having, put the same thing that came in out of it. <laughs> it's just that simple. And you're running into the main reason why I say this. Uh, people think, well, not everybody, but some people think that you can just put any engine into anything. And actually, that's true for the most part. With enough money and time, you can do just about anything you want. When it comes to swapping engines, however, especially modern engines that have computer controls, fuel injection, that kind of thing, you really have to be mindful of how you're going to manage that system. So in some cases, what you might have to do is you may have to swap out the entire wiring harness and then the ECU on top of that so that it knows how to run. So it's... The engine doesn't end at the engine compartment anymore. It comes with a lot of baggage. And that baggage, as I said, comes in the form of that wiring harness uh, in addition to the brains, the computer, to run it. So you really, you really have to consider that. Uh, also, if you're taking an automatic transmission or you're taking, you're swapping an engine that was like, okay, let me back up. Your car has an automatic transmission in it. We're just doing hypotheticals here. Your car has an automatic transmission in it. Now, the engine that you got came out of a car with a manual transmission. There may be subtle differences between the two. For instance, uh, the Honda D-Series engines and also B-Series engines. With the automatic transmission, they had an EGR. With the manual transmissions, there was no EGR. And that's because they met emission standards without doing that. So you swap those over from one to the next, you're like scratching your head, and you're like, hey, wait a minute. Now I've got to swap the whole intake manifold and everything else out because this one has an EGR, this one doesn't. And, and it gets to be kind of a mess. So what you have to do in your case, I'm telling you <laughs> why I, I try to stay away from this stuff, but in your case, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to find out where those wires go. You may have to swap the wiring harness to go with the new engine that you have. It depends because it, like, it sounds like you've got the same type of engine. You've just got a newer version of it. Um, yeah, and if it's VTEC and the engine you took out was not VTEC, you're, you're going to need the computer, you're going to need the wires and everything that, that control the VTEC solenoid to make that work. It kind of gets to be a headache. If, you, if you're asking my opinion on it, if, if you're changing out engines like what you're doing, is you're putting in something different than what was originally in there, that usually comes with some headache. Uh, and sometimes you never get rid of the headache. The easiest way to alleviate that headache is to know that you know, sometimes it's good to take the engine and transmission and just swap it all out, and then the harness, and then the computer to go with it. That way everything's there. But if you're piecemealing it, yeah, mm, 
All I can say is good luck to you. Not you'll be all right, but you may have to spend some time with a manual to find out where those wires go, what's supposed to talk to what, and all that stuff. Um, okay, we got Louis Sosa. Hey Eric, I've learned a lot with your videos. Uh, just made a compression test on my 318i BMW E30 that was consuming oil, 90 psi in each cylinder. Saturday I will make a leak test as you made in the SUV video. Any reason for such low compression? The engine was hot, thanks. That is low compression, honestly. Uh, I'd like to see numbers like somewhere around at, you know, at least 120, hopefully 150 in that situation. I'm not saying you know that's supposed to be that way across the board, but it's interesting that it's like that on all cylinders. It seems low. If you had like say uh, in, in that video you watched about the leak down test, if you had say one cylinder that was down or two cylinders that were down on compression, you know that would sort of lead you to something, and that and that would tell you to to look towards those cylinders. But the fact that you've got what seems to be low compression on all cylinders makes me wonder a couple of things. The first thing is, did you do the test correctly? Um, one of the things that's often overlooked, and I wish I would have put a finer point on this when I did my compression test video, was that you've got to have the throttle open when you're doing the compression test. And what I did in my video was I went in and I pushed the gas pedal all the way to the floor for two reasons. One, most fuel injected engines, and I say most because I had a conversation with Scanner Danner about this, uh, an issue that he had once. On most fuel injected engines, when you depress the gas pedal past the 80% mark, what that does is it tells the computer that, okay, you go into what's called clear flood mode and turn off the injector. So no injector pulse. It says, okay, the engine's flooded. The owner is trying to clear the flood out. I'm not going to send any more fuel in there to make things worse. So that's what it does. It puts it into a clear flood mode. Well, I, in my compression test video, I did that for that reason, so that it wouldn't be injecting fuel. But also what it did is it held the throttle plate open as I was cranking the engine. If the throttle plate's closed when you're cranking the engine, you're not going to be able to draw in enough air to get a proper reading on your compression test. Second thing that can affect your compression test, a low battery. If your battery has a low charge, it's not going to be able to spin the engine over fast enough to give you an accurate reading. So in that instance, what I would do is I would make sure, one, your throttle plate was open when you did the test, and also test your battery and make sure it's good. If your battery's a little weak, you might want to throw a battery charger on it while you're doing your cranking, and that way that will help the engine spin fast enough so that you can uh, get proper readings. The fact that all your readings are low like that and you've got an oil consumption problem is suspect in my opinion. Uh, it may not be your rings, it may be your testing. So I would go back and try that test again and make sure it's correct. You know what? <clears throat> that, I'm afraid, is all we have time for today. Half hour show. So, if you have automotive questions and I wasn't able to answer them here today, head over to EricTheCarGuy.com. Now, I could go through the whole spiel about the fact that we have a, you know, a categories for you to search through that can uh, offer up all kinds of answers without you having to do a thing. I could also talk about a search function that you can type keywords into and your check engine light codes that can also give you answers as it searches through our database. In addition to that, we have a wonderful forum with uh, people there that are knowledgeable and happy to help. Um, newest member to our team today is Toyota Carl. Hey, man. Welcome aboard. Uh, but anyway, we will do our best to try to help you over at EricTheCarGuy.com. And if I missed anything, you know what? There's a welcome video when you land on there, and away you go. In fact, when I get done with this video, I will put a link in the description to as many things as I possibly can that uh, can be useful to you. And I can also be found on social networks, Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, and I close each of my videos with, be safe, have fun, and of course, stay dirty. Now you can stare at me blankly while I turn off the Hangout <laughs> and broadcast. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you in a couple weeks. I do these every two weeks. So um, in two weeks, I think it is the, let's see, today's the ninth. It should be the 23rd, I believe, will be the next show. I'll put an announcement out for it, and uh, we'll answer more of your questions. Stay dirty. See ya.